Her spirit is your spirit, Lord. Supply of strength that she has. That's what I always think of when I think of her. I thank you for her. She's blessed us all in so many ways. And we send her out, Lord. So she is willing to go and leave the comfort of home and everything she knows and go before her land, Lord. And to show people your love and teach them about your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord. Just fill her to overflowing. Her path is always prepared. Lord, you made the way for me, Lord. You go before her. Just bless her, strengthen her, encourage her every day. And we will be praying for her every day, Lord. Just work through her. Work through her to these people who need you, Lord. Jesus. Joanna, I hear the Father saying, I'm proud of you. Thank you for value, Lord. Thank you for acceptance. Thank you for your pride over us, Lord. We're your children and you love us. Thank you for your daughter, Lord, for those great uh, ignite strength in her right now in Jesus' name. That she would just feel your spirit and rushing through her. Thank you for bring all the details together, Lord. Our money's coming to you. We're going to have a thousand pills and you'll take care of every single detail. And we just love you for that. We love the way you do that for us. We want to recognize and thank you for that. Holy Spirit, we just say, come. Have more from your way. And I'm just I'm so grateful, Lord, for this amazing adventure that you were on with your daughter. And I'm just waiting to hear for um, the reports, Lord, and all the different things that you're going to do. So we thank you for protecting her. We thank you for providing for her. We thank you for making a way where it seems to be no way. And we just thank you for the great vision, Lord, for her love. We just thank you for every desire in her heart that you put together, Lord, in her mother's womb. You put desires in her heart, and you're going to bring out every single one of them. In Jesus' name. notice in your bulletin, uh, there's no title in there. Don't blame Caleb, blame me. <laughs> New Direction, that's the title. Acts chapter 9. We're going to go verses 1 through 31. We're not going to cover every little nook and cranny in there, but some important things we are going to look at. Um, Here's one thing I wanted to have you keep at the forefront of your, of your mind as we go through this. So we've been making our way through the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is really a story of how the church, the bride of Christ, really becomes the church, the bride of Christ. It had never existed previously in the way that we know it now. 
The Holy Spirit, Jesus left, the Holy Spirit came, filled the room that were praying. They started speaking in other languages. Um, from there, they started proclaiming about who God was and what he's like and that Jesus was real. And if people wanted to accept that, they need to accept Jesus Christ. They need to repent, be baptized. And it says that thousands are being added and multiplied to their number daily. And it describes the early church as a group of people that were one in heart, one in purpose, and one in mind. How powerful a picture is that, huh? Wow, God, we need that more, don't we? Oh, we so do. We fight so easily. But they were strong in unity, and that was one of their marks. And as they were growing, right, other opportunities of ministry were growing. Some people call them problems. I like to call them opportunities of ministry. And so from that place, the 12 apostles, they never intended to cover every little issue that ever arise. So then they appointed deacons to help out and serve in their roles. And then we learn from, you know, the book of 1 Corinthians that, in fact, it's not even just about elders and deacons. It's about everyone being used in the body because we have all been born in the image of God and every Christian has the spirit of God living inside of them. So that in and of itself, if you're a Christian, a born again Christian, the spirit of God lives inside of you, you inherently have supernatural ability to contribute to the body of Christ and transform the world around you. We could just go now. That's like, that's a good deal. That's a good deal. And so, Keith brought some fire last week, apparently, which I heard about. I didn't hear the message yet, but I will. But I will. And he was talking about, right, with these deacons and the people that were there, right, we had the first martyr, Stephen. He died. He was killed for no good reason at all, other than being powerful in the Holy Spirit. So then that puts him on the chopping block, literally. So... He gets killed. A lot of similarities there between him and Jesus. Then last week, Keith brings some fire, talking about Philip, um, an Ethiopian, and getting baptized. And so now we pick up with this guy that has been a troublemaker. That's an understatement, by the way. A troublemaker in the early church. His name being Saul. Guy's a problem. And so we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 9... And look at his life and what is this guy's deal? Because he was there actually approving and consenting to when Stephen got stoned to death. He was the one that said, yep, this is good. In fact, I'll hold your coats while you do it. He was a current religious leader who was well-educated, um, that was grown up in the very uh, pharisaical way, sat under Gamaliel, which is a really well-known uh, Jewish rabbi. And so he had a lot of pedigree. He was recognized. People would know about him. And he was recognized and had pedigree for being extremely religious. Not much of a relationship, but super duper religious. So I want you to think about this thought as we dig in, as we dive. I'm just going to pull out a few different things today. But I want you, hopefully this thought, even if you forget everything else, try and hold on to this one. Okay? And it's this slide there. It says, God consistently transforms... God consistently transforms serious sinners into dynamic disciples. Consistently, regularly, all the time. He's always transforming people's lives. For me personally, as a pastor, nothing. And you know, people ask me, like, you're just away for a week, you know, how was it? I was like, honestly, I really like what I do. Like, I, I enjoy it. 90% of the time, there is that 10%, you know, that can just... 90% of the time, I really enjoy just being around, like, what God is doing and being around the people of God. I, I love that. I, like, I'm doing what I was born to do. I, I like that. That's fun for me. I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Feel alive doing that. Like, it's cool sort of, like, sit around the beach, you know, and just chill and not think about anything. But I wasn't created to do that. I need seasons and moments of that, but I'm not created to just chill all day. Like, that's it's not meant to. So, one thing that gives a lot of joy to my heart being a pastor is seeing legitimate lives transformed by the Spirit of God. I, that's amazing. That's called a win, baby. That's called a success. That's called yes. That's called hallelujah time. Yes! I love it. It's the best. When a life is going a particular direction and then they choose to respond to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit 
and then they change direction. I love that. I love that. I love that. Hidden within there is something that also grieves my heart, and that's when I like to think of it this way. I think of transformation, spiritual transformation, right? Looking more like Jesus Christ. That's what I consider transformation. But then there's this other thing that just kind of weasels its way in there, and I feel like it just grieves my heart. It does more harm than good. It's called positive life change. So I think of positive life changes, and then I think of Holy Spirit-led transformation. So positive life changes, those would be something like, you know, you get a new job, or maybe you get a promotion at your job. Um, maybe there's like lost relationship within friends or family, and then it like gets reconnected. Um, or maybe you get like a new romantic relationship. Um, or maybe, uh, you know, someone walks into, they get a new house, right? They're just, there's situations in life, or maybe they break free of addictions. Those are positive life changes, amen? Those are good things. What kind of stinks sometimes is that people will be started down this track of spiritual transformation, embracing the Spirit into their life, and then when some of these positive life changes happens, you would think the natural response would be, wow, this new job happened, this new relationship came into my life I've been praying for, I finally broke free of these addictions over here. You would think almost every time the natural response would be, oh, I want to run closer to Jesus and surrender even more. What really stinks is that a lot of times the positive life changes actually like create a further barrier for people and become more of a hindrance and obstruction from spiritual transformation rooted in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because like once I kind of got these things that I was so stressed out about that I was just hitting walls on my life for so long and when those things finally happened for me, it's like, ah... I don't know if I'll make it to church this Sunday, you know, like, I, I don't know, like, ah, that Bible study thing, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not, like, I'm not hurting right now, you know. We just find little ways to sort of just kind of give in a little bit. When before, when we were really hurt and they were top priority, man, God needs to show up in this area. And then when he does, sometimes, not all the time, there are those people that say, praise you, thank you, Lord, and they go, man, even harder after the Lord and be taken to new places and new levels within the Holy Spirit. And that's awesome. But I think of spiritual transformation that started with the Holy Spirit. What that means, you're also going to get some of those life changes. Some of those positive life changes are going to happen because of someone surrendering their life to Jesus Christ. Amen? They will people will get into healthier relationships. People will reconnect with other people. People will break free, break free of addictions. Deep-rooted desires, like Keith even prayed for for Joanna, right? Deep-rooted desires, they will come to fruition. But at the same time, transformation, the way the Bible describes it, it talks about it as being made to continue to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. I'm being made into the image of Jesus Christ. So even though all those things happen, now when they happen, that's not an excuse for me to sort of like get away from all the sacrificial, like hard stuff of the Christian life. That's actually a reason for me to go even harder and find ways to bring up Jesus Christ, to talk about the gospel, to share with other people, you know what? Jesus really is the Son of God, and let me tell you why. Power of prayer actually does work, not as a last resort, but as a first option. And let me share with you why. So I think of like these two sort of things like they've just weaseled their way in and the enemy just, he's just good at weaseling stuff. Positive life changes can be very deceiving. Oh, my life is changing positively and sometimes it's sad when you see people a lot less. But we want to be after not just positive life changes, that would be a byproduct. We want to go after spiritual transformation that the Spirit is doing from the inside out and we want to embrace that. And the picture of Paul, well, Saul, will become Paul, in Acts chapter 9 is an awesome picture of this. He was going one direction in life. Now he's going to go a totally other direction. 
The interesting thing is, <laughs> he doesn't actually really benefit personally out of it. He's not going to make more money. It's not like he accumulates more power. He doesn't get some kind of greater status. He, he just like loses everything. And he still says yes. Interesting. So let's take a look at this. So verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So that's who we're looking at here, right? He hasn't stopped. It says, He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. It's like 100 plus miles away. So that if he found anyone, or if he found any there who belonged to the way, excuse me, everybody say the way. way. Yeah, you wouldn't be known as a Christian, like at this current context, like a Christian, that, that'd be weird terminology. You would be known as someone who belonged to the way, which I, I kind of like that. That would be a cool church name, right? That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Definitely good for a t-shirt, I'll tell you that. But that was normal. Like, they wouldn't say Christians, you know. They'd say, they wouldn't say spiritual, you know. They wouldn't say all these other things. They'd say the way. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And so that was what he did. He went to these, um, to the high priest. And he said, hey, can I get your permission? Just sign off. I'm going to imprison anyone that I find that's even associated to the way. Verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You know, the first time that I read that, you know, like, if, if you grew up in church, and if you didn't, you don't have to worry about this. But if you grew up in church, and you're on Sunday school stuff, I was always taught that he was on his horse. And he got knocked off his horse, and the light did <laughs> It's no horse. <laughs> Why are they lying to me in Sunday school? That is like wrong. I can't do that. Where'd they get that? It's no horse. But they're going so far, so people are like, oh, maybe he's on a horse. And, yeah, I don't know. So anyways, he's going near Damascus on his journey. A light from heaven flashed around him, fell to the ground, heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Pretty interesting. Just take this one thought away, Okay. Gee, he didn't say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute the church? He said, why do you persecute me? Jesus specifically, I don't care what language you look at it in the Greek, it, it's a possessive, like, it's himself. So it's interesting how Jesus, like, significantly interweaves himself with the church. He doesn't separate. And there's a lot of people that are like, oh, yeah, I love God and love Jesus and have a relationship, but I don't want anything to do with the church. That's a very foreign idea to Jesus himself. That's something that we have created. Jesus is saying, are you kidding me? I, I, I died for them. I purchased that. It cost me my blood. Yeah, that's part of me. Just like any good husband or spouse are going to say, oh, that's not just that. That's me. They get hurt. I'm hurt. They're dealing with things. I'm dealing with things. We're a joint package. Joint deal. So Saul, why are you doing this? Verse 5. Who are you, Lord? <laughs> Kind of answered your question there, Saul. He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He says, now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. The number three is always significant, right? It's amazing how he was basically spiritually blind like his whole life until literally he has an encounter with Jesus himself. And then when that happens, his physical eyesight goes. In other words, he was spiritually blind the entire time until he met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, his physical eyesight went kaput. It's interesting. It 
So verse 10 says in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying in a vision. He has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So who's this guy, Ananias? He's not an elder. He's not a deacon. He's not an apostle. He's a nobody. Everybody say nobody. nobody. If you say it the New York thing, it's kind of more fun. Say nobody. nobody. See, that's more fun. He's a nobody. He's a nobody. No offense, Jess. New Jersey. I can't say Jersey. Say Jersey. Do something Jersey. She can't. No, I don't want you. Because then you won't stop. Never mind. Don't do that. Don't stop. Yeah, there you go. So, he's a nobody, right? He, he's not. He's, <laughs> true. Sal, no offense. Um, Forget about it. <laughs> He couldn't resist. Come on. He's not going to pass that up. <laughs> he's not passing it up. So he's there. So he's just this nobody, right? And he's just having regular just time with the Lord, I guess. And the Lord speaks and makes something very clear to him. All of a sudden, he just has this vision. And the Lord speaks to him. He says, hey, you know, there's this guy, Saul. And then I say, yeah, I, I, I know. And he says, I want you to go minister to him. I want you to go pray for him. So... He says, this guy, Saul, I said, I want you to uh, come, place your hands on him and restore his sight. Verse 13, Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So again, we have just a normal disciple, follower of Jesus. He's going to restore sight to this guy because... God guided him that way, and apparently he's also going to pray for him, and Saul will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Pretty interesting, right? Right away. He just flipped. <laughs> Verse 21, all those who heard him were astonished. I bet they were. And they said, isn't he the one who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Right? There's something to be said for those serious sinners when they turn into dynamic disciples. They're almost unrecognizable. But you do what now? Why'd you stop doing this? Why'd you stop doing that? Why are you talking like this? Things just change, and people don't even know how to, how to even handle that. What do you even do with that? Especially with someone of his pedigree and the note that he was carrying imprisoning people. So it says, after many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. <laughs> go figure. What a switch of events. He gets the note from religious leaders, hey, let me go in prison and just do whatever to people that are part of the way. Has an encounter with Jesus Christ. All of a sudden, he's the man being hunted. He goes from the hunter to the hunted. Just like that. Verse 24, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. 
And when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid, not believing that he really was a disciple. Yeah, I could see why. But Barnabas, everybody say Barnabas. Barnabas. Yeah, that's our man. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So this guy Barnabas, he's like, you know what? I actually want to hear more about this, Paul. Like, what are you doing? What's going on? And Paul is sharing with him, like, hey, I had this, like, encounter with Jesus. He said, why are you persecuting me? And then people couldn't hear it, but they knew something was happening. But I could, and I saw this guy in Ananias, and so Jesus must be real. He's the son of God. And I've been going to every synagogue and telling everybody about it. And Barnabas is like, really? Like, tell me more. Other people are like, yeah, I don't want yeah, to mix with him. But Barnabas was interested, right? He, he thought that something there was genuine, was authentic. And so he befriends him, and then he tries to bring them further into the circle. And we just read in verse 30, when the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. They said, Paul, we don't know what to do with you. Like, this is like a crazy city. What do we even do with this? Like, are you dangerous or are you not? Do you have some other agenda? Like, what's happening here? Is this a real transformation or are you just doing this like to try and make more problems for us and imprison more people that are part of the way? They don't know what to do with it. So church leaders just said, man, get out of here. <laughs> Real wisdom at work here. <laughs> Let me remove myself from the situation. As they, they just sent them off. And if you read in Galatians 1, Paul actually talks about his name gets changed to Paul. Paul gets, uh, yeah, his name gets changed. I already said that. But he goes and he gets sent off and he talks about in Galatians 1 how that was a blessing and a help for him. How he needed that time in his life. And then we read in verse 31, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's like one of the biggest transformations in the New Testament. One of the biggest transformations. Um, I told you I was going to do this for the next like couple months at least. I want to just put the plain meaning up there, Steve, just so we got that. And then I just got a couple of thoughts I want to share with you, and then we're going to close up. Plain meaning is this. The most hostile enemy of God's church becomes a follower of Jesus, and the early church reacts to his miraculous transformation as his fellow Jews attempt to kill him. Essentially, that's what happened, right? That's just the really plain meaning of the text as far as what's happening and what's developing and what's going on. I just want to give you a couple insights that I'll just share with you. Here's the first insight that I want to give you. God regularly reveals steps of his plans for us one at a time. One step at a time. Only after we are faithful with what he has given us to do will we know what to do next. Now, in the NIV, it doesn't do a great job talking about, in verse 5, it says, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And in fact, there's also in other versions, Saul says, What do you want me to do? What should I do? What do I do? I just had this encounter with you. Now what do I do? This is obviously real. You are real. So what do I do now? And there's many people, right, in the Christian faith. I want to know God's will for my life. What do I have to do? What is God's will? What should I do in this moment right now? What do I do? And a lot of people are very unsatisfied with this answer. Here's the answer. The answer is this, and you might also experience this dissatisfaction. The answer is surrender and offer your life over to God the best today that you know how. Just do that today. 
Try to do it again tomorrow when you get to tomorrow, but we're not even there yet. Well, tomorrow I got a big day. I got and I don't know. And I don't Yeah. Right. Today, just surrender the best that you can and offer yourself as a vessel. Do that. Do that. And then once you string together a couple of days of that, they'll turn into weeks. A couple of weeks are going to turn into some months, going to turn into some years. Pretty soon, you're going to be able to know like what you're going to do. And the one thing that Jesus told Saul, Paul, we're just going to call him Paul, and I'm, I'm going to stop going back and forth. Paul, the one thing he told him to do is say, hey, listen, just go to Ananias' house. Just go there. And I love how we don't have a record of, okay, what do I do when I get there? What should I ask him? Yeah. What, like, what time should I get there? Should I bring something? Do I bring a gift? Does he need money? Like, how do I? None of that. You know, like, none of those sort of questions that we ask in an analytical way, like, to nausea. A lot of times he just says things like very, just, hey, you make this move in this particular area. And I don't know what your areas are. But he'll just, he'll communicate things to you. Say, listen, in this area, make this move. And honestly, when it comes to like, when I counsel and just work with people and do stuff, it's, it's interesting how many people are so frustrated that they're not experiencing certain things from God. And much of it is because they never took that one little, might not be little, shouldn't say that, but that one step in front of them that God is calling them to make. In other words, they've been given an assignment from the Lord and not exactly stewarding that well. And they're having a really difficult time with intimacy and hearing from the Lord and then moving. And I'm like, well, what about that thing? Yeah, well, you know, I'm trying to... Well, no, that's like, that's the issue. You want to like aggressively go after that and try and be obedient as you can in that. And I promise you, he will lay out the next step. Well, what about everything else? I don't know. But he'll lay out the next step. So you want to know, like, what God's will and what's going on. Listen, just be as surrendered and as faithful as you possibly can right now. Don't complicate it, because he's not going to give you all the details anyways. Think about your life. Think about Paul. Do you think Paul ahead of time be like, okay, you know what? I, I'm okay with this plan, Lord, where you just let me persecute you for a long period of time, because, of course, I'm not going to regret that. So that'll be fine. And then, uh, yeah, knock me off a horse, even though it's not a horse, and then, and then entrust this gospel. Make me, as an apostle, as he says, ad, abnormally born. And then let me be shipwrecked and bitten by snakes and hated by people and stoned and whipped. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. We should do that. No, no. Yeah, amen. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to happen, right? We can't know the deed. Everybody say we can't. We can't know the details ahead of time. You don't want to know them. They're not as cool or as great as you think they are. <laughs> the fruit probably will be, but man, what it's going to where it would bring us, and it's going to be tough. Just right now. Just like right now. Like what is God calling of you right now? And it's not going to be some monumentous, huge like thing. You know, I don't know what it could be. I don't know who you might have to text or confess something to or volunteer yourself for or put yourself in a position of. I don't know. But I promise you, if you were to surrender and just offer like yourself to the Lord the best that you can today, I bet you in a couple of days you might have an idea of something. So I just wanted to share that one thought. Another thought I have, it takes time for others to believe that someone is a true disciple. It takes time. It takes time. Spiritual experiences are not a substitute for transformational choices. Spiritual experiences are not a substitute for transformational choices. So people say, yep, I'm a Christian. I prayed that prayer. That's a great start. Now there's a life of sanctification that has to be followed up with. It's not just about, hey, I gotta just, I gotta say that prayer, or I gotta do that thing, or I gotta give that money, or I gotta do this service, or I gotta do this stuff. It was never about earning God's love in that way. It was always about receiving it 
and then being in relationship and then following the prompting and leading of the Spirit within the confines of that relationship. So, spiritual experiences. Listen, the people that are on the road, they had that experience to some degree as well. I don't know. We don't have anything in the Bible about them that were there. That's a horrible sentence. But about them that were there. We don't know what they chose after. Hopefully they chose Jesus. I don't know. For Paul, we definitely know. He made some choices and he went after it. Right? Transformation it has to do with our, our volition, our, our ability to choose. And so we choose if we're going to partner with the transformation process or not. And so it is my prayer, and I am hoping, and then we are continuing to plead in prayer and say, Heavenly Father, like, as you build and grow your church here, like, help us to be a people where they really want to cooperate the best that they can and partner with you the best that they can. A heart that's hungry to partner, where it's not necessarily all on God or all on the individual. It, it's some of both. There's a partnership. God has things set up. He's got certain plans and certain purposes. And he's waiting for his sons and daughters to make faithful moves in the ways that he's directing. And for a lot of things in life, we won't experience or ever know about until we choose to partner in faith with what he's calling from us. Paul had to do it. We all have to do it. Every faithful son or daughter has to. And again, I don't know what that looks like for you. But boy, is it worth praying about, thinking about, asking other people about. Or you just ask another trusted brother or sister, hey, how well do you think I'm partnering with the Spirit in my life? I don't know if you've ever asked that question to another fellow believer. Now that you think about the question, you're probably like, yeah, how come I haven't? <laughs> I don't know, wouldn't it make a lot of sense to ask another trusted believer, hey, how well do you think I'm partnering with the Spirit in my life? Be open to the response, though. Don't start a fight. Don't do that. Got to be humble if you're going to ask somebody about that. Other thing I wanted to share with you. Preparation is always needed and almost always underestimated. Preparation is always needed and almost always underestimated. Absolutely. It's interesting for me to think. Preparation on two fronts when you think about Paul. Number one, it's genius from God's standpoint that he took someone with such pedigree and such a background in Jewish religion, in the laws of Moses, and then flipped him to follow after him. Like, what a perfect person to have in these synagogues talking about the law of Moses and what it meant and all the implications and all the current rabbi teachings of the day combined with revelation from the Holy Spirit. Just perfect. Genius, right? Genius. And then I think of it, as soon as we read about, as soon as he, let's say, gets saved, has a born-again experience, that next, I didn't say next day, it says immediately after he goes into the synagogues and starts preaching, Right? It doesn't say that there were any converts. It doesn't say he was massively successful. It doesn't say that really nothing, nothing about the results. So it's not even like he could go back to the elders of the church and say, hey, listen, I did have this experience. I've been going to synagogues, and like, look what God's been doing. It's obvious. Essentially, he's just going on his own personal encounter and experience. And the church leaders are like, nah, I want to believe you, but I don't know. What happened while you preach? I, I don't know, but you know, I'm telling people about it. You know, like. So in Galatians 1, when he says, you know, I just had to be away, he was away for five to seven years. And a lot of times people think, well, he had this experience, and then he just started in the ministry, and boom. In fact, no, he started that, and it didn't work. He just hit a wall. People weren't really responding, and the church leadership said, you know what, you just need time by yourself. You need time for preparation. His entire calling was he was supposed to be a vessel, an instrument to be used primarily for the Gentiles. Everybody say, that's us. That's us. We're the non-Jews. We're the Gentiles. That was his role. Peter, he's supposed to go to the Jews. Paul, he's supposed to go to the Gentiles. And for the first time, Paul gets the calling on his life. 
And what does he do? Time to go get it. Jump into it. And he just hits walls. And you just feel the brakes going. Arr! Holy Spirit just breaking on him. Nah, yeah, that is the calling, but you're not ready. It's just not time for that yet. And isn't that a frustrating place to be in life sometimes? When you feel like you can kind of get a clear picture as far as like what the Lord might be doing with you and how he's working with you, and you're like, oh, yeah, then I just got to start doing these things. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. In fact, more times than not, those very same people, even Moses, he did the same thing. We read the entire, entire book, almost, entire book of Exodus together. Oh, I'm supposed to save my people. He goes out the next day, breaks up a fight, and then they didn't receive him at all. He ran away. So anytime we get clarity on what God might be doing in our life, that's not an immediate indication that we should just jump all in both feet and just go crazy. There's a certain element of just patience and preparation. And like I said up there, like, honestly, it's always needed for sure, almost always underestimated. Almost always. I remember when I first started teaching over at Notre Dame West Haven, you know, teaching math, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like, I don't even, I don't want to do that, you know. <laughs> so I'm thinking, eh, maybe two years, you know, and then we'll like plant the church, you know, we'll just see kind of how things go. I severely underestimated. <laughs> severely. <laughs> Ten years later. I mean, I'm like seven years later driving to school just crying in the morning. I'm like, God, what? Why? This doesn't make any sense. This can't possibly be like what you had in mind. It doesn't make any sense. And I can just remember those mornings and those afternoons. Uh, I must have been really fun to live with. But, you know, that was like, <laughs> oh, my gosh. But you get to those places and you feel like you have clarity on certain things. And it's just, it's just not moving at a pace that you're comfortable with. Or you're happy about. Oh, man, those are tough. But they're so needed. And I am so, so grateful for all those times that maybe like, you know, just crying out, just in confusion and expectation on being met. I'm so grateful that he doesn't come in like a bad parent and just like give me candy and just shut me up. Oh, here you go. Just, just, just stop now. Here you go. You want this? Oh, okay. Here you go. <laughs> right? Those band-aid things don't help me long term and they don't they certainly don't grow me. And they're definitely not preparing me for what lies later on. So I'm so grateful he didn't answer those prayers immediately the way that I wanted to see them answered. Because you know what that did for me? At least in that one example, I got lots of examples like that. But in that one example, it's just about that teaches me now as an adult, I can wait upon the Lord and he can be trusted. That takes a long time to learn that. But it's so worth it, and it'll change you for the rest of your life. When you really feel like you have full confidence that, yeah, it's a Bible verse, and it's somewhere, and that's something I should believe. No, 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 no. When you really have to go through that and learn that, and you really feel like you're on the altar, it's totally worth it. Totally worth it. And that's what you want to pass on to other people. Because you don't want to pass on to other people God the genie. You want to pass on to other people, God, the faithful Father. Yeah. So let me share. Almost there. God loves to take the background and experiences of all people and leverage them for his use to advance his kingdom. He loves to do that. Background and experiences of all people leverage them for his use to advance his kingdom. He did it with Paul. He's doing it with you. He's done it with me. Listen, the fact that you're so jacked up and have a questionable past at best does not make you a liability for the kingdom. It makes you an incredible asset. What are you talking about? I mean it makes you an incredible asset. I mean it's about his working, his plans, his purposes. And if you're so vastly impressive, that actually is kind of problematic. And that's why Paul would say things like, you know what, I'm really glad I'm not an amazing speaker. I'm not a great orator. I'm not real slick. I'm not, I don't have a lot of, I might even be kind of boring and rough to look at. I mean, that's the way he talks about himself. Because then he says, you know what, when the power of the gospel is displayed in my life, there's no doubt it's not me. 
we know who it is. And so it's for everybody. Like, that's for all of us. So our backgrounds and our experiences, like, he will take that and use that and leverage that in his infinite wisdom and in his amazing ways. That's why it's important for us to not be held captive and to be, like, in a jail somewhere based on our past and our experiences. We have to let the Spirit set us free from that so that way we can not ever talk about it again. No. So that way we can use that as leverage for someone else when they need it. We have to be able to ex access the past so we can point somebody towards the future in Christ. And if Christians will never talk about their dirty past and all the little secrets and things that happen, like we're leaving out significant parts of the working of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And I don't mean you should tell everyone your deep, dark secrets. I did not say that. <laughs> But there are pockets and seasons and people from time to time and place to place that you got to just share stuff. Like they need to know a greater chunk of the story that makes you look worse and him look better. And we got to share him. We got to be vocal pieces for that. So let me just leave you with this one thought. One thought is this. Paul obviously had a uh, tremendous uh, calling on his life. Who knows what, you know, and he had multiple callings, by the way, but one significant one is he was, you know, to the Gentiles, a vessel for the gospel to the Gentiles. We're going to have all kinds of different callings, different ways we're going to be vessels. But the reality is, right, we are going to be victorious vessels. We are going to be. You are. If you're a Christian and you gave your life over to Jesus Christ, you are a victorious vessel. And think about what a vessel is. A vessel is just something that just, you just use to get you to a certain point. You hop on a ship, it takes you down there. Right? I used Enterprise, you know, last week. That was my vessel, you know, to get down there. And I was just using it to get there. Um, you're using your cups and things like that, plates. You know, there's vessels you're just using to accomplish another end. Well, God's just using us? Kind of, yes. To advance his kingdom, his glory, and his agenda. But also at the same time, he doesn't want to just use us. He wants us to partner with him and experience some of his power, some of his joys, and some of what he's like. So yes, he's sovereign God, ruler of all, but he's also a father of heart. He wants us to experience some of the things that we get to receive that Jesus Christ paid for. That's a ridiculous deal. So yeah, we're vessels, and to be so cooped up on like our, it's just ridiculous to think about a vessel being so consumed with itself. It's not even the job of the vessel. It's like, what am I being used for? What does God want to do with me? And so I put two verses up there, you know, 2 Corinthians 4, one. It just says, we got this treasure in clay pots, which we really do. We got this treasure of the gospel for those that are Christian, treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ inside these clay pots. And it wasn't intended to just keep us to ourselves. And in that other verse right there, Revelation 12, it talks about how we overcome by the power of the blood and the power of our testimony. And so it's very important for us to step into the reality that we are victorious vessels, that we will experience continued breakthrough in our lives, emotionally, mentally, and physically. As sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, we will continue to experience more victory, more overcoming in our mind, in our emotions, and in our bodies. That's a really big deal. You will continue to have victory and breakthrough in your life. And it's very important that you talk about that and that you share that with people. Because Jesus Christ has overcome, he has defeated death, he has defeated sin, and when he comes to reside inside sinful bodies that maybe are default and prone to that, he actually changes us the way we're not oppressed by that anymore. It's a life of freedom, and it's a life of growing, it's a life of changing. And like we said at the men's breakfast a couple weeks ago, healthy things grow, growing things change. So be stuck a certain way for a period of time and just being resistant to things. We're fighting the Lord on that. We're fighting the Lord. So I'm looking at victorious vessels. You're looking at a victorious vessel. And we're not being arrogant about that. And listen, the fight is significant. The foe is significant. The battles are tough. 
They're going to be difficult. It's going to require a lot. It'll bring us to the end of ourselves. Also, God will give us more than we can handle. Sorry to ruin the cliche, but he will. (laughs) They would be significant, but I can tell you this. I know that in some way, shape, or form, I don't know all of it, but I know that Jared will be victorious. I know that I fight from Jesus Christ's victory. I know that I bring something incredibly supernatural and significant into the lives and circumstances and circles that I come into. I know that I do. And I come with expectations. And I get kind of bummed out when I don't see all those expectations. But some of those need to be righted in my mind. But that's for all of us. That's not just for me. That's for every Christ follower. So, new direction. Amen on that. Saul to Paul. Wow. But he's doing an amazing work in our own lives as well. It's not just about Paul. It's about everybody. Walking into it. Experiencing it. Having his power be made manifest in the believer's life. Because that's actually what preaches volumes to the world around it. We don't need more preachers. Like, you know. We need more sons and daughters that step into who God made them and called them to be. And experience victory and overcoming and what the power of the blood actually does. God, we just, we can't thank you enough for who you are, God. You, uh, the, the, the phrase, how great is our God, is a question as well as a statement, Lord. We, we, we are saying how great you are, but we will never fathom exactly how great you are until we are with you in the kingdom, Lord. And we just thank and praise you for that. We're, we're, we're never surprised, always amazed at everything you do, Lord. So we just, again, we thank you for the service. We thank you for everything that you've done in our hearts, God. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.